Hi, Heather. Hey, haven't done one of these with you in a long time. No, that's true. You have not. Uh, you've done you've done them recently. You've done uh, you did a blogging heads with Dan Dresner only days ago. Only days ago, but this is like going back to the roots. To the very roots of uh, yes, uh, yeah. In fact, you know, you, blogging heads is ten years old. Did you know that? I am sort of amazed at the idea that I have been blogging for 10 years. Yeah. Or maybe we, and that maybe, there's 10 years worth of video of me online. Maybe, terrifying maybe, maybe neither of us cares to uh, reflect at length on the implications of this. So let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. Uh, this is The Wright Show, actually on meaningoflife.tv, although also featured on the homepage of Blogging Heads TV. You are Heather Hurlbert, uh, and you are currently at New America a think tank where your title is director new models of policy change and could we ever use some of those uh but you've you've done a number of things you've been uh your executive director i think of the national security network in washington and you've been a speechwriter to i believe uh for hillary clinton herself and anybody else down there president president clinton as well mm -hmm. or the first president clinton as i've heard like of him first. Um, Madeline Albright and a number of other arts and culture and academic figures. Okay, well, good. So we usually on Meaning of Life TV, we have people who are experts on psychology or philosophy or spirituality or theology or something, self-help. And they talk, they are in some sense experts on some aspect, some dimension of the meaning of life, I guess you could say. But we've also had a series of conversations with people who are notable for reasons other than that and just ask them like where they find meaning and so on. Uh, and you fall into that second category. You are notable. You. No, <laughs> yeah, yeah, close call. Notable for non-meaning of life reasons. Um, and we're going to ask you about the meaning of your life. But I also want to broaden the conversation a little and talk about the whole business of meaning, finding meaning in Washington, which is the milieu you have been immersed in for low these many years. Um, so is that congenial to you? Yeah. I mean, the dirty little secret about Washington is that people who, who do well here and kind of don't lose their center are people who, who find some way to, to stay in touch with something that's larger than Washington. Mm -hmm. And that's hard because, frankly, most people who come here and this is true as much as I might wish that it weren't. This is true across ideologies. Most people come here for reasons that are very closely connected to whatever they think the meaning of life or their higher purpose is. And so it, it seems kind of counterintuitive when you first get here. You know, I mean, after all, you're putting in 80-hour weeks on behalf of whatever vision of, of Valhalla you have. But the, the people who make it as decent human beings over the long haul you know, whether it's belonging to an organized religious community or meditation or whatever it is, find some way of, of reminding themselves that meaning and purpose are bigger than, you know, the latest omnibus bill. Mm -hmm. OK, but now for the big question, are these people who actually manage to remain influential or is there a little bit of a trade off between hanging on to your soul and acquiring and using power? The way I would put it is that, um, do you know, there's this great scene in Gone with the Wind um, where Rhett, of all people, is giving Scarlett a lecture and says, you know, you can't put your treasures overboard for the duration of the war and think you can pull them up afterwards and the salt water won't have cor uh, corroded them. Mm -hmm. And that's how, kind of how I think about it, that when you get into the very most intense jobs in D.C., there's an enormous amount of pressure on you that really nobody comes through unscathed. Mm -hmm. Many people come through that and are kinder, gentler, better, more, more humane people afterwards. But nobody's more humane during, if you, if you know what I mean. <clears throat> there's always short-term damage. Yes. And what is it about the place that's damaging? What is it you kind of have to do? to be a, any kind of player that's corrosive? Well, you have to be able to, to prioritize what's important in the short term in Washington over what might be important in the long term in other ways. So, you know, people have likened taking a fancy job to deployment in the military. Just, just forget about your kids for two years. Make arrangements for someone else to raise your kids. 
Um, you know, maybe you go to a prayer group or you have a meditation practice or a yoga practice, unless you're Rahm Emanuel and you secretly practice yoga at five o'clock in the morning before you go to the White House, you know, forget about it. Um, so that, just, that's, how he, that's how he remained so placid throughout his career is yeah. it was the yoga. <laughs> well, I assume it's how he hasn't had a massive coronary yet. Yeah. Um, you know, which is which is an interesting reminder about there being all kinds of spiritual practices that that don't necessarily make us gentler, hmm. gentler people. No, but there's a you know, Washington, the short term, the immediate demands are very intense. And that always entails certain levels of of compromise and of putting, you know, putting values up against other values. Mm -hmm. So are there are a lot of people who have these kind of secret spiritual lives or therapeutic lives or whatever. I mean, are there a lot of Rama manual type things we don't know out there? Uh, um, well, there's another example that's been been written up somewhat. So I'm, I'm not telling any secrets, but Dennis McDonough, uh, President Obama's chief of staff, who happens to be my neighbor. Um, and Dennis, again, this has been written, I'm not, it's not a secret, but Dennis is, is an old style Catholic. Um, and Dennis, you know, he still goes to church. Um, and I had the experience, I have a child with special needs who was playing on a special needs little league team and who showed up to coach my kids special needs little league baseball team, but Dennis McDonough really said to my husband, don't look now, but you see that guy helping our son with his swing. Did he have a son on the team? No, no. He brought his kids with him. So he was both spending time with his own kids and doing something that's giving back to the community. I mean, that's unusual to begin with. Leave aside special needs. It's it's usually little league coaches, in my experience, have kids on the team or, or certainly kids, you know, in the in the league or something. Um, so so Dennis is one. I mean, and Dennis is his Catholicism is is part of everything he does. Mm -hmm. um, I know a Republican who's somewhat less senior, so I'm not going to use his name because I don't have his permission. But um, he actually started out in div school. Um, and went on to be, you know, ended up sort of dropping out of div school, going to law school, getting, this, is, a, this is short for divinity school, we should say for a more secular. Uh, thank listening. you. Yes. Yes. He started out going to Catholic divinity school, in fact, wrote, wrote a master's thesis on some very esoteric theology. Um, and then decided that wasn't the right path for him, became a political operative, worked in the Bush white house. Hmm. This is someone we would have heard of, at least if we're if we pay close no, attention. No, no, okay. you'd have to be kind of geeky. Well, there you in my go. Uh, um, so, so my hypothesis remains intact that there may be a trade-off in how spiritually motivated you are and the heights you attain in Washington. Maybe. Well, I mean, to give you to give you another example, um, like I think of Sandy Berger, who passed away recently, and I don't know. I mean, when I knew Sandy in government. Um, you know, it wasn't like he was running out of the office to get to to Friday evening services. Um, and when I knew him afterwards, when he was, was on my board, we never we never talked about anything remotely spiritual. And, you know, Sandy was always a nice guy, um, made a terrible mistake, which perhaps we don't have to talk about in this context. Um, or we can. Because well, just, I mean, as long as you brought it up, he, he, he was uh, trying to take documents from the National Archives, right? Or something like that? Yes, yes. Um, but um, Sandy, it turned out, was a fairly steady congregant at a big reform synagogue in town. And when he died, had an enormous out-the-door funeral in this very religious context, which I think, you know, might have surprised a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, so, so there is... And as I say, both formal and informal, you know, the people who, who meditate or who tell you they're Buddhist or that, that there's a lot more people have a kind of sustaining underlife than you think. But but the interesting thing is at least and this is this is something for Democrats or liberals that's maybe not as true for Republicans, but people are kind of ashamed to talk about it. Mm -hmm. I assume Joe Biden is a pretty genuine Catholic. I mean, who are we to judge? But I mean, I, that doesn't seem like an act to me. Yeah, no, he seems genuinely moved. Um, one more, one more anecdote, which was actually fascinating to me and, and highlights the sort of partisan nature of this. Um, I uh, had the occasion to go to Israel with a bipartisan group a number of years ago, 
And I was amused to discover one morning that a number of the Republican men on the trip had snuck out super early to go to the Holy Sepulchre, the church where, um, frankly, some medieval medieval scam artists created this whole medieval tourist trap <laughs> of places that Jesus was supposedly crucified and so on. Right. It, it really is good to know that human nature hasn't changed at all in a thousand years. <laughs> but anyway, these guys, and they didn't want to, it was interesting, they didn't want to say anything to the, to the, to the liberals or to the, the women. And I think they must've thought we'd make fun of them, but they had slipped out first thing in the morning to sort of go there at dawn. Huh. Huh. And that, that was a real moment that I thought, oh, there's lots of stuff about people's spiritual life that I'm not seeing. Yeah. Um, but I want to talk more about Washington, but why don't we take a detour and talk a little about you? So are, are you religious, spiritual, none of the above? Were you brought up religiously and so on? So I am actually religious. I am a practicing Episcopalian. I was raised a liberal Protestant. Um, mine is the first in maybe five or six generations on my dad's side not to produce a Protestant minister. Really? So, so yeah, I, I come by it. All. Yes, my um, cousin, grandfather, great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather, going back a couple more generations, were all uh, or are all congregational ministers. Wow. So, so on that side of the family, I, I come from a long, I mean, sort of uh, no shit Puritans, I always say, <laughs> you know, like, I mean, as, as I, the Puritans themselves would not put it. Yes. Exactly. Yes. They would be very irritated with me about that. But, you know, no, I have an ancestor who got off the second boat or so. Um, the notion that we're all totally responsible for ourselves and very probably already damned because of stuff we've already screwed up is very prevalent in my family's just kind of daily thinking about the world. Mm -hmm. So would you say that your decision to enter public service is kind of an extension of that legacy? And I mean, motivationally, was it kind of something in the air in your family that yes. you do something other than just then try to become rich materially? Yeah, I know. And it's interesting because my parents are both journalists and they are of an age where, and I know this sounds quaint and anachronistic now, but journalism really was a higher calling to them. I, re, I re, it was very when I was went into the trade, it was there was a real idealism surrounding it. This was right after Woodward and Bernstein, and so on. But but it had, I think, you know, predated that. I, I don't know how old your parents are, but um, uh, that that was. It's a good point that that may be has become less true. And I hadn't thought about that. I mean, journalism yeah. was something you were really proud to say you were, you were practicing precisely because it, you clearly had foregone material reward, even back then when it paid something um, for, you know, to do good. Well, and yeah, you perceived yourself as a fighter for truth and justice. Mm -hmm. And Com I think comfort I think, the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. The comfortable. And I think, I mean, this is again, the thing where, spirituality in Washington gets so dangerously entwined, which is that there's an awful lot of us in politics, in journalism, who wake up every morning and sort of think that because of what we do, we've already checked the I am a good and righteous person box. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, frankly, that's when you get yourself into the most, the most trouble. Right. Do you think, um, well, let me uh, actually sustain that just a little. So you actually, uh, you said you're brought up in liberal, uh, liberal Christian household. You mean kind of theologically as well as politically? Yes. Um, I mean, I thought that blowing in the wind and um, where have all the flowers gone were hymns um, because we sung them in church and I didn't. I, I, <laughs> okay. I was, it was, it was until later that I was introduced to the, you know, the 19th century canon. Um, and, you know, like, most kids, I couldn't wait to not go to church and sort of was highly impatient with the hypocrisy and awfulness of it all. Um, got pretty far away from it. Started reading theology at some point in my 20s. And, um, you know, to quote a friend of mine who went back to church around the same time, I said, well, why are you going back to church? And she said, well, you know, I need practice. The thing you do in church is practice. And, and I've just found that, you know, having a structure Having a structure helps me 
be sure I have a place where, our, like I said, I'm thinking about something bigger than, you know, who got mentioned more times in foreign policy mm-hmm. last week. So you do go to church? I do. And then, and then this is the funny thing about my family. We do a lot of practicing because I married an observant Jew. Um, and so we used to, you know, when we were in our 20s and you had time for everything, we used to have a great deal of fun going to each other's things and, you know, sort of arguing about them and talking about them afterwards. And then, you know, you have a kid and you get a management job. And now what I mostly do on Sunday mornings is teach Hebrew school. Hmm. Hmm. Now, now this is uh, reform. Your your husband's congregation? No, um, it's um, it's unaffiliated. It's unaffiliated. Um, uh, you know, some might say that Episcopalianism and much of Judaism have something in common in that there isn't uh, there isn't a conception of a very anthropomorphic God, at least that looms large the way it does in say evangelical Christianity and. And so on. I mean, do, so in that sense, do you feel you're on the same wavelength? Yeah. I mean, the other things that are very common is that there's a, a very high regard for sometimes probably too high a regard for the intellectual part of of the faith mm-hmm. and a, a love and reverence for tradition without the idea. And I know you're all humming the Fiddler on the Roof song now. But at least in the the liberal end of Episcopalianism where I hang out and in the Reconstructionist end of Judaism where my husband hangs out, the idea that that tradition is a is a guide, but it's not a straitjacket. So just because women were never priests or that's not even true. Women were priests, actually, just because women weren't priests in the medieval period doesn't mean women can't be priests. Um, And you could you could go on and on from Mm -hmm. there. You know, tradition has a voice, not a veto to use Mm -hmm. another cliche. So yeah, we, um, we always say that if we got maroon on a desert island, we'd have our own religion and it would be just fine. Mm-hmm. Now there is, uh, from an Episcopal pulpit, there is God talk, right? Unlike say your average Unitarian congregation, they're not that liberal. Oh yeah. Right. And it can be very, very anthropomorphic in ways that kind of drive me crazy. And, you know, one of the, one of the really, I think, fascinating things about American religious life in general is how much, how much it turns out to keep any kind of organized structure going. You have to do the anthropomorphic stuff, even if certainly not the clergy and many of the parishioners probably don't actually believe it. Mm -hmm. Um, But no, I recently, um, we were in Vermont over Christmas and just for fun, we went to a church on Christmas day and, um, priest gave this hilarious sermon where he was wielding a copy of Smithsonian magazine telling us with great excitement about how there was new studies that suggested that the Gospels were too written closer to the life of Jesus than those nasty Germans said they were. And I'm kind of, I mean, you know, the the curses of being a foreign policy person is I sat there in the pew thinking, yeah, I bet who's funding that work is people who want to get evangelicals more excited about the relationship with Israel. Huh. That you have been in Washington at least long enough. I thought you were going to say you started speculating about who funded the original writing of the Gospels. Then you know you've been in Washington too long. That's actually a great question. Who were the Koch brothers of seventy-five A.C.E.? Yeah, well, there 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 must have been people in whose interest it was to write them. <laughs> that's, that's but, but actually, I mean, that sort of gets you to to like why. Because the thing that I really enjoy about organized religion, which is a thing that drives many people crazy about it, but that it does actually kind of bring up all of the, I mean, all of the great questions are there. And if you get away from the idea that all of the great answers are there and you just focus on the, oh, this is another way of looking at the same questions that plague humanity everywhere all the time. And it's, you know, a nice remove from how Mm -hmm. you do it in your professional life, then, you know, it's, it's a great thing. So questions like what? Like, why are we here or what? Well, why are we here? How do we treat each other? What do we do when we treat each other badly? How do we live with each other in community? How do we live with jerks? How do we deal with really terrible things happening? What do you do with, you know, what do you do when your rulers are idiots? Mm -hmm. Um, What do you do when the rules are unfair? Mm -hmm. So, and stop me when I get too personal, but... uh... So, it, and, and if you want, you can answer on behalf, conjecturally on behalf of your fellow congregants, if you don't feel like answering your behalf. Oh, it, that's even more dangerous than getting too personal. Well, don't. that assumes they're, they're, they're viewers, uh, which I would encourage. Um, the, uh, but the, the question is kind of, so 
does this mean that there is actually a conception of the divine, but it's very theologically liberal, very abstract, or just that there isn't even that? My experience is that people's conceptions are really different. Um, and you just never know that there are people in very liberal settings who really believe that the, to whom the personhood of Jesus say is very, very important mm -hmm. and who, who really believe that sort of Jesus is personally like, like a person, you know, sort of who is as real as you are looking at me on the screen. And you mean is still that? It's still that. Yeah. Yes. Oh, oh, yes. And then people who have an incredibly vague construct of the divine. And you can't predict from who cares more about high church ritual mm -hmm. what they're going to end up believing about, about the nature of God, mm -hmm. in my experience. There's no, there's really not any correlation. And also, I mean, being, you know, being wasps, we don't talk about it very much. Yeah, that's true. So no one, no one interrogates. Fortunately, no one interrogates me on a regular basis as to what I think about that, the person. That's why God has sent me, Heather. You're not getting interrogated, interrogated enough. So um, uh, maybe in a way the question is, uh, no, it's not the question. It's a different question. But I wonder how, how many people in your congregation have a sense of... Um, you know, I think there's kind of a fine line between feeling the pangs of conscience the way a totally secular person can and feeling as if there's something out there kind of judging you or something out there you want to align your moral conduct with. Does that make sense? You know, just because of my upbringing, it actually doesn't make sense to me um, that the idea is that hopefully my conscience is aligned with the greater, the greater good, the right, the ground of being, whatever it is that's out there. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if my conscience is aligned with something else, then mm -hmm. it's malfunctioning, if you will. Right. So you use the ground of being, the term the ground of being, which of course is a, a, a term actually famously associated with Paul Tillich, who was here. I am at Union Theological Seminary at this moment, which is where Paul Tillich was in New York. Um, so you are using a little a little divine language there, but but the idea is not I gather that that the ground of being isn't this thing that from the great beyond is is continually making itself felt or but rather that it's a kind of ideal in some sense that you should strive for your conscience to be aligned with. Well, I'm going to throw out one other little bit of theological jargon, and then I promise to stop. Um, but one of the first um, women who was ordained in the Episcopal Church is a theologian named Carter Hayward, retired now. And she, the, the way sort of she tweaked Tillich and others like him, which, which I've always, which is when, what sort of I decided to settle on and, and permit myself to stop agonizing about the question, was, she says, God is in the relationships between people. Mm -hmm. And that you know, many days, not all days, but many days, that's enough for me. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that gives me, and so, you know, sort of to your question about conscience, then what my conscience is focused on, and this, you know, starts to move us toward the question of purpose in life is, what are the things that are most beneficial for not just individual people, but this idea of a network or of an invisible connection among people? The, can you say that again? So, so, so this is getting at the idea of purpose. Yep. Yep. So if we are all the time, you know, there's, um, there's a, there's theological jargon again, the idea that you're, that we are co-creators of the world mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. God. So, so, and again, you don't, you don't actually have to believe in God, I think, to believe that, right? Cause we are creating meaning, we're choosing all the time whether to create meaning or fail to create meaning. We're mm -hmm. choosing all the time whether to create positive meaning or negative meaning. And so, you know, since, since I got put here with the amazing ability to create meaning, and since, you know, my effort to create meaning through being a professional ballet dancer didn't work out, and the, the skills I have to create meaning, you know, turn out to be mostly of the intellectual variety, 
plus like how I move through life, then what I'm doing here is trying to create meaning, trying to do things that strengthen the networks, both visible and invisible among, you know, both like the people next door, the person who cleans my house, but also, you know, like how do I think about, you know, say Syria? Mm -hmm. And am I trying to do things and trying to, you know, to the extent I can influence anything, get my government to do things that I think strengthens relations among human beings, strengthens humanity among human beings, or things that actually end up further tearing down those things. Mm -hmm. I mean, I so, go ahead. So that's why I get up in the morning. Okay. Uh, so, so you feel you have a higher purpose in some sense, which is, I don't think I have a higher purpose more or less than anybody else. Right. But I think, you know, for again, like my higher, I am like, I was not the way I got put on this earth. I don't get to, like, I'm not making a lot of good meaning through art that, um, I'm not, um, I'm not uh, able I see. to. So it could be it could be something entirely different. You're you're not saying that the, the meaning that one that anyone should pursue is in is in the strengthening of relationships among people and so on. That's one that's one avenue. Mm, actually, um, that's a little more small C Catholic than I would go because I do think I mean everything that people are doing that's worthwhile. Um, adds to the stock of, I don't know, I mean, connection in a very broad sense that also includes things like art and music and nature and sort of leaving things that someone else will come along and have a connection to. So in the very broadest sense, yeah, I do think that's what everybody's here to do, not just me. Okay. Um, okay, let's, uh, why don't you return to Washington? <laughs> uh, it, you know, it is, so, so, so I gather your sense is that most people at least come to Washington with high ideals. Yeah, not all, but most. And would you say that's equally true of um, electoral politicians? You know, I once talked to a guy, you probably know him. I'm not sure if he's still hanging around Washington, but uh, he, he was liberal, broadly speaking. And, and he once said to me, and he had been there while he had known a number of people, and he said, you know, he said, I've never met a, uh, you know, a national electoral politician. So I took that to mean senators, congressmen, presidents, whatever. He said, who was not an asshole. Now, is he putting it too strongly? And if so, by how much? Um, so, OK, Chris Murphy, not an asshole. <laughs> Um, Mark Udall, not an asshole. Tim Kaine, not an asshole. Um, so that's three. That's three right off the top of my head. Um, Hillary Clinton, not an asshole. I recognize that that's not a unanimous opinion, but like I work for her and she is in person to individual people, a deeply good human being. Okay. Um, so, so two things about that. I think Everybody goes into the beginning of their public service career. And I should also say, I know lots of Republicans who aren't assholes who are elected officials. I know who are not elected officials. I know fewer Republican elected officials, but I don't mean to imply that I think all Republicans are assholes because they're not. And there are also Democrats who are assholes, you know, sad to say. Safe to say, not, yes. Yeah. But um, everybody goes into public service with some kind of higher ideals. And I think the thing that, I mean, there are some people who get totally cynical or who decide that sort of pursuing their ideals is too painful and they just kind of forget about them. But the people who are more dangerous and the, or the thing that gets one into more danger is when one has one's ideals and one doesn't go back and examine them mm -hmm. periodically. And so that's when you get into doing things that get you farther and farther and farther and farther from what you got into the field to do, but you're not checking in. Right. And I think what's dangerous, which is closely related to this, is just the ability of human beings in general and the tendency of human beings to convince themselves that whatever they're doing is for the greater good. I, I think we all, uh, y you know, and, and I think that's what's kind of worrisome. You know, Peter Beinert had a really good uh, piece in The Atlantic um, that he wrote, I think, just hours after the Iowa caucuses where he said that... Uh, 
Marco Rubio had done well in the caucuses by basically adopting Trumpism. He, he had become more xenophobic, more economically nationalist, in some cases in ways that flagrantly violated things he had said not long before. Now, I don't doubt for a second that Marco Rubio is thinking, well, OK, I have to do this now, but it's in order so that I can be elected and do good. And people do that infinitely. And then once they're elected, they have to make the compromises. And um, I, I, uh, it, it seems to me that on the one hand, people, uh, especially the kinds of people who seek power in Washington, well, well, I say people in general are good at convincing themselves that whatever they do is for the greater good. And then the kinds of people who seek power in Washington, I think, will just twist themselves in pretzels to seek to get and hang on to power. And it seems to me that's kind of a dangerous combination. Yeah. And I think, though, we've seen in, in recent years more of an influx of another type into Washington. And the people who are resolutely opposed to any kind of compromising, there's also a whole school of, of kind of um, moral laziness that goes around that. And there's a, there's a fondness for absolutism that is not in and of itself a form of virtue, much as, much as it reads as virtue, but, you know, it's right. really not. And we got right. lots of examples of that in history. As right. Well. It reads as principled. I mean, I mean, they like to read it as principled uncompromising. Um, I, I think that's a response to what's going out there in society at large. I mean, it's, it's because there's a market for this kind of politician that I think we're seeing them. Uh, but, but, but there are also people that you don't really want to hang out with at your local bar. Yeah. yeah. No, I think, I think the, well, and at local bars, there are people, you know, <laughs> that's my point is, I mean, there's, a, there's a kind of um, ideological tribalism out there in America that is reflected in the kinds of people who are doing well politically. Well, and there's also, which, you know, is an interesting way to circle back to the spirituality stuff. There's a, a hunger for certainty and a hunger for absolutes in an age that is really unkind to absolutes and certainty. You know, you mm -hmm. can you can go online and knock down anything if you want to. So mm -hmm. so I think people and and again, just as I think politicians kind of get a little confused between their higher purpose and their day job. Um, so does, you know, the voting public, and again, this is true across ideologies, so much wants our leaders to be, to be something other than careerist, which is what you have to be to be a politician. You know, they, they want mm -hmm. them to be saints. They want them to be, you know, I don't know, Savonarola or Moses or, you know, the guys from the life of Brian. Um, but that there's this placement and, you know, frankly, even before the advent of the evangelicals into politics, that there's always been in American politics, this kind of confusion of elected presidents, elected officials and, and quasi religious figures. You know, we might have it's an interesting question of whether we'd have avoided that if we had a monarchy, which we could confuse with mm -hmm. religious figures. Yeah. And, Probably, and, I suppose. and it seems to me like right now, the, the kind of, infinite malleability of people who want power is somehow particularly spooky because of the kinds of issues that they're being malleable in response to. And, and I'm thinking about kind of the, the war on terror and the way fear works and xenophobia works. Some, somehow, to me, that's just more pernicious than like claiming that by cutting taxes, you can actually increase revenues, you know, like they're, they're kind of, they may be equally dishonest, amplifying fear, maybe, maybe about as dishonest as, as saying something that's just mathematically not the case, but I, th there's something kind of creepy about a lot of what's going on now. It seems like. yeah, and you could argue that the role that government is being asked to play, the reassuring role that government is being asked to play and that some of these policies, you know, the whole notion of security theater and all the things that we do that aren't really that effective mm -hmm. or that are, that are visible to the public, but that, or, you know, in the immortal words of Scott Walker, we have to have a policy that responds to Americans being afraid, not we have to have a policy that responds to actual threats, which is, right. you know, how right. I learned policy in grad school. But 
So you can argue, I think, that as Americans have rejected kind of um, absolutist religious structures telling us what to be afraid of and how to mediate our fears, that we now sort of, like, you want the government to mediate your fear for you. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, which is a dangerous business. Um, yes. So uh, anything else on Washington and meaning and spirituality or anything? You know, um, I think maybe people don't picture this about Washington, but all of the sort of good, bad, and hokey um, ways that people get higher meaning and connect to higher meaning that you see in other places across the country also exist here. Um, a couple, and I, I will now out my sort of utter um, flyover country hokiness in this regard, which is that um, very shortly after the uh, terror attacks in Paris this past fall, I happened to be singing in an interfaith concert. Now, there is nothing hokier than an interfaith concert, right? You know, it is like, let's put on a show in the barn and build democracy. And, um, but I love to sing. I find it good for me in both spiritual ways and psychological ways. So I trundle off to this thing and there's an imam and there's somebody blowing a shofar and there are a bunch of Sikh drummers and there are some Hindu dancers and there's the mighty men's all male African-American chorus um, and there's the D.C. Mormon, um, the Mormon choir of Washington. And then there's, you know, this um, Jewish group, which I sing in, being a good Episcopalian. And, you know, to actually have a venue where you can act out the, the higher vision of this country that we all say we have. And it was incredible. I mean, I, and I was all sort of like, oh, I'm too cool for this, you know, but I'm, I'm going. And once I get there and, you know, it was a wonderful moving thing. And I think you'd find that maybe way more than the rest of the country gives us credit for. Lots of people in D.C. actually have those mm -hmm. those hokey things. And they're the things that keep you sane. Mm -hmm. No, I'm sane all for it. And, and I'm all for it. So each each contingent kind of sang songs from their own cultural tradition. Is that the way it worked? Yes. And then there were some shared some shared things. What were the shared things? Um, what's, well, what's, the what's a what's a song that encompasses all those or 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 is equally distant from them? <laughs> or is equally cliched for all of them. Um well actually the the great like the the sort of two thousands kumbaya is probably Siahamba. I don't know it. Um but. so it's uh I believe Zulu, it's a South African mm. language, and the English lyrics are, we are marching in the light of God, mm -hmm. which is awesome because if marching in the light of God is fine, and there may well in the original be other verses about how we're marching to slay our adversaries who are marching in the light of a different God. Mm -hmm. um, but um, So that's totally fine. And then um, the, uh, the Irving Berlin, Emma Lazarus, um, Statue of Liberty. Mm -hmm. Which, interestingly, everybody, I don't know. I mean, my parents learned it in school. Um, and it's, again, it's terribly cheesy, but it's Irving Berlin, and he did cheesy well, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know. Well, that is, so, no, go ahead. Mm -mm. I was just going to say, that's commendable. I applaud it. <laughs> I'm not sure I'd want to sit through it, but I applaud it. No, well, that's exactly, I mean, this is, this is the problem with all this kind of stuff is it's much more fun to do. I mean, which is, which is maybe another point that's worth making about that is that stuff you spectate at does not have the same result as stuff you do. Mm -hmm. So again, like having a meditation practice is way better than going and watching a whirling dervish performance of other people meditating. Mm -hmm. um, having a prayer life is way better than going to church or synagogue. There's a synagogue in Washington that uh, one of my family members refers to as blank synagogue, the musical. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, one, one can approach all of this stuff as a, as a very consumerist thing. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, it's just, then it's just one more consumer thing. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, I don't, um, I mean, I deliberately, I don't, I don't, um, publicize this stuff. I don't try to get all my work colleagues to come or anything like that because frankly, again, I don't assume that like watching it mm -hmm. gives you, gives you much benefit or connection. Although 
I hope it does. I mean, I, I just hope knowing that it's happening. What I find is whenever I do overcome my embarrassment and mention it, somebody will say, oh, you know, I've been thinking about finding a place to sing or, oh, you know, I've mm -hmm. been meaning to explore. So that to me is what's sort of what's worth the reason it's worth talking about it. Mm -hmm. That's great. So one final question, I guess uh, you've, uh, you know, a lot of times if, if I ask people just in the abstract, what gives your life meaning? And I don't think I've quite posed the question to you. They often mention family, offspring, and so on. You've already been, said uh, your mother. I'm sure if I said, does motherhood give you your life meaning? You would say yes. But so we'll skip that part. I'm curious about the much discussed problem of, you know, having a serious career and being a mother and perhaps particularly in Washington. How's that working out? That was an unfair curveball. Yeah, well, I figured close with a bang. You can, you can take the fifth. Um, no, you know, I think it's important to talk about this. I am to some extent mommy tracking right now. Um, I'm working, um, I'm working at a think tank and doing some side gigs rather than having a big fancy job with a lot of responsibilities determined by other people, um, because of some situations with my family and some things that seemed like the, you know, I was the person who needed to do these other things. Mm -hmm. And I don't think about it very much in sort of moralistic or religious terms. Normally, the way I think about it is, gosh, as much as like, I am a very hard, I mean, cutting career person. You've been in meetings with me. I'm a jerk. I argue my point. I like to win. I don't tolerate fools well. Um, it's hard to imagine me doing crafts. Um, in fact, just for the record, I am terrible at doing crafts. But the way that I sort of frame it is this, it has, I have been very much at peace with feeling like I made choices that are right for the larger things that I want. And I think it's important to talk about them because I want other women and men to be able to have these choices. Mm -hmm. you know, I have a kid with special needs and he just requires a little more connection than many kids do. Mm -hmm. So I've chosen to be available. I hope um, that is not going to last forever. But um, so, you know, in answer to your question, um, it's working amazingly well for me in that I get to do work I really care about and that I think matters. And I get to raise my kid the way that I want to. Mm -hmm. um, that isn't easy. It isn't as financially remunerative. You have to fight for it all the time. You have to give things up. There is no having it all. Um, and I'm incredibly fortunate that like I can even make those trade-offs because most people can't, don't mm -hmm. have the opportunity to, to make the trade-offs that I get to make. Well, I guess it's good that you're working at a think tank run by a woman who is quite acquainted with this whole issue, Anne-Marie Slaughter, having written the most famous modern treatise, I, probably on, the, on the, her, her famous Atlantic piece on the challenge of, uh, and, and, and the difficulty of having it all. Right. Well, I mean, look, there is no all for anybody. I mean, and I think one of the, one of the useful things about being raised female in this culture is that you get disabused of that a little faster. And then you can focus on, well, okay, what pieces of it are most important to have? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, listen, Heather, thank you for taking time out uh, from work and or family. Sounds like a little of both um, for this and uh, for thank you for sharing, as we say, which you, which you, which you really did very generously and, and keep singing. You are very welcome. Thank you. And um Let's enjoy another 10. We'll do this again in 10 years. In 10 years. Yeah, yeah. If I'm here. Yeah. Okay. Take care. You too. All right.